The Fed's looking at unemployment, and it's based on the so-called Phillips curve. It says, you know, unemployment's down, inflation's up. If unemployment's up, inflation's down. That's the Phillips curve. You know, you can draw it, and the Fed's using that to guide policy. The Phillips curve is garbage, and it's not a not a personal insult against you know Professor Phillips. It's it's the case that there's no empirical support for it. I could give you examples going back to the 1930s of low unemployment, low inflation, which you had in the early 60s. 1930s, we had high unemployment, low inflation, even deflation. Late 1970s, whether we have high unemployment and high inflation, that was called stagflation. So I can give you examples. If you think of it as a quad chart, you know, unemployment, inflation, you know, fill in the blanks. I can give you all four examples: low, 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 high, high, low, high, high, which means there's no correlation. If you can have any one of them, there's no correlation. So the Phillips curve has no predictive value. On its face, because the data doesn't back it up. Last time I looked at a Phillips curve it was a flat line. At least where I went to school, curves were not flat. But there it is. Now it's worse than that because unemployment, even if you thought it was a good indicator of something, particularly inflation, it's a lagging indicator or a lagging indicator of a recession, as the case may be. So let's say you're an employer, a business person. I mean, you're, you're an entrepreneur. I start businesses. When you're in a tough spot, when revenues are down and things are slowing down, margins are getting compressed and all that. The last thing you want to do is fire people because it took a while to find them, hire them, train them. You don't want to let them go. You do everything else, like you turn down the lights, you call your landlord, negotiate a cheaper rent, slow pay your creditors, you know, drive a hard bargain on something. You do everything else to maintain your margins, and then only when all else fails do you start firing people. But so first of all, it's a lagging indicator. You're already in the recession. Before you get around to firing people, number one, number two, because you held on so long, you tend to do it on mass. It's like it's not like well, I'm going to fire one person a month for the next year. It's like I'm going to hang on to all of them and then maybe sadly fire them all at once because I have no other choice. So a, it's a lagging indicator. B, it can turn on a dime from very low unemployment to very high unemployment within a matter of months. And if that's what the Fed's relying on, which they are, they say so. It's not a guess. They say that's what we're watching. Two things. Number one, you're not going to see the recession coming. It's a lagging indicator, and it can go from kind of good to bad almost overnight. So the Fed's, you know, drive, you know, driving this way, looking out the the back window, and they're going to they're probably going to wreck the economy. But there are a lot of other signs to say, okay, okay, Jim, you know, unemployment's not a good measure, and it isn't. But how do you know what what are the good metrics? They tend to be a little technical. They tend to be things that very few people look at. But they're there. They're not secret. The big one, and I, I think this gets more no, notice, is an inverted Treasury yield curve. Well, what does that mean? So a normal yield curve, it's it's like the longer the maturity, the higher the rate. That's common sense. So if I'm going to lend somebody money for a month, I might charge a certain interest rate. But if I'm going to lend you money for 10 years, I want a much higher interest rate because there's a lot more risk. You know, inflation, default, credit risk. Who knows what?、Uh, so a normal yield curve is upward sloping. The longer the maturity, the higher the rate. Okay, right now yield curves are inverted, which means they're downward sloping. Which means the longer the maturity, the lower the rate. Why would you take a lower rate on a 10-year Treasury note than you would on an overnight loan? Which is that's where we are today, by the way. So in other words, this is the big money. This is the institutional money. This is people who know more than central bankers in many cases betting that interest rates are going to come down a lot. Because if they weren't, that that inverted yield curve would make no sense. And so they're they're betting that the economy is going to going into a severe recession. Interest rates are going to drop. Now, just to get a little more arcane, there's something called the SOFR futures curve. You know, SOFR is the new LIBOR. You know, the problems of LIBOR.、Uh, but these are long-term bets on overnight rates. With you know, Treasury is a snapshot of what I think the 10-year rate is going to be. But the SOFR is the opposite. They 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 trade in strips. You know, quarterly settlements that go out three or four years, five years. But the long longer ones aren't that liquid.、Uh, but basically, I can make a bet. As to what I think the overnight rate is going to be one year from today, that yield curve is also steeply inverted. The, and again, this is the real who trades SOFR futures. Well, the institutions and and central banks and the big money, in other words. And and it's in the data. It's not a guess. Like you can look at it. It's publicly available. And it says rates are going to drop steeply in the months and year ahead. So again, these are. When you have an inverted SOFR yield curve, an inverted Treasury yield curve, it, it's basically the big money betting the rates are going to drop like a stone. Well, why would that be? 
Well, there are only two reasons. One, a severe recession and a steep drop in inflation. And those two things do go together. One more example, again, I don't want to get too in the weeds, but there's something, uh, the Fed has an overnight reverse repo facility. And what does that mean? So the Fed says, hey, send me some, give me your cash and I'll give you a treasury bill as collateral. And then we'll unwind it at some point in the future. It's called a reverse repo. So I can call up the Fed, uh, have them send me treasury bills as collateral, give them cash, and they'll pay me interest on that. It's it's a phone call. I don't have to do anything fancy. Okay. But the treasury also sells treasury bills uh, at auction, and I can bid on them. And people do. And the yield to maturity on those is, is lower than the Fed will give you for a phone call. So why would you bid at an auction, you know, take the market risk and get a yield that's lower than the one you can get for a phone call? Well, the answer is that the treasury bill that they send me when I do the, the treasury facility, I cannot rehypothecate it, meaning I, I have to hold it, give it back to the Fed when they want it, but I can't give it to you or anybody else. Whereas if I bid at auction, I can take that bill, I can pledge it to UBS, UBS can pledge it to Deutsche Bank, Deutsche Bank can pledge it to Barclays, and they do. So, but the reason I bid more aggressively for that and take a lower yield, I'm, I'm fighting for a lower yield instead of the higher yield I can get for free, is because I need the collateral. That's a sign that there's a collateral shortage, uh, that banks are reducing their balance sheets, they're unwinding derivatives, et cetera. So sorry to be a little technical, but the point is when you look at two inverted yield curves and a, an, a, an auction rate that's lower than what you can get for a phone call, they all say the same thing. Rates are going down, the economy is going to crash, and there's collateral scarcity and banks are tightening uh, tightening up their balance sheets. So they're all they're all bad signs. So it reminds me of another indicator, just quickly. Swap rates are, we have negative swap rates. What does that mean? Well, what is the swap? So I buy a 10-year treasury note and I finance it in the overnight market. So what's happening to me? I'm getting the yield on the 10-year treasury note and I'm paying an overnight real. So receiving fixed, paying floating. Well, sometime in the 80s, you know, uh, in my experience, at some point somebody said, hey, why, why don't we get rid of the bond? Like, just pay, fix, and receive floating. Who needs the bond? The bond's a piece of collateral, but we can have a contract. So that was that's a swap, a simple form of swap. So I do a swap with Deutsche Bank, and Deutsche Bank says, okay, Jim, I'll pay you the 10-year rate. You pay me the overnight rate. It's exactly the same as if you had the note and we're financing it in the repo market. It's just receive, fix, pay, floating. And that's a swap. But if you think of the credit risk, at least with the 10-year treasury note, I got the United States government behind me. If I'm doing a swap with you know, UBS, I got bank risk. I got some credit risk in the bank. You know, credit switch is real. So it's, it's logical, it makes sense that the rate I get from UBS should be slightly higher than the treasury rate. The swap rate from a bank should be slightly higher than the comparable maturity of a government security because the government security is slightly safer than a big bank. Well, right now, that's not true. UBS, or yeah, you know, I don't want to pick on UBS, Barclays, anybody else in a swap, the rate I get is lower than I get from a 10-year treasury note. So why, why would I do that? Why would I take the poor credit and take a lower rate instead of a higher rate? Well, the answer is the swap is off balance sheet. And the treasury note, if I own it, I got to put it on my balance sheet. So when you see negative swap rates, meaning the riskier credit is paying you less than the government credit, what it means is that the balance sheets are constrained. I got I got to do the off balance sheet trade because we can't use up the balance sheets. That's consistent with what we just talked about with the inverted yield curves, which is there's a major credit contraction. There's a collateral shortage, a dollar shortage, and a credit contraction. That's not a recipe for recession. I don't know what it is. There were a trillion dollars of subprime mortgages. These are mortgages that, you know, no documentation, don't have to prove your income, very non-credit worthy. But there was a there was a bubble mentality, a frenzy, and everyone, hey, buy a house and borrow money, fix it up, sell it for twice as much, walk away rich, you know, and everybody was doing it. Mortgage default rates rarely get above 5%. 5% is really high in the mortgage market. So people were saying, you know, smart people like Ben Stein, the financial analyst, but, but the central bank and others were like, well, okay, let's get crazy. Let's assume a 20% default rate, which, is, which ne has never happened, but just assume that's true. On a trillion dollars of subprime mortgages, a 20% default rate would be a $200 billion loss, which was only slightly higher than the SNL crisis of the 1980s. You know, adjusted for inflation, it would have been a comparable loss. And the attitude was, well, we survived the 80s, we'll survive this. Yeah, it's bad, banks will take losses, stock prices go down a little bit, but we'll survive. What they missed is, yes, there was $1 trillion of uh, subprime mortgages, 
but there were six trillion dollars of derivatives. Yeah. That was invisible. So all of a sudden, 20% of that was 1.2 trillion. So you, you create derivatives out of thin air, yeah. uh, and there's no limit on how many you can have. They're off balance sheet, meaning give me the balance sheet of the company, I won't see them. You have to read the footnotes and then the, the information behind the footnotes. So non-transparent, unregulated, no limit on size. So the, the crisis was actually much worse than anyone realized. And then when it started to collapse, the, the, the contagion spread throughout the financial system. My point about 2008, it was because we did not learn the lessons of 1998 and we flew right into 2008. But once again, we have not learned the lessons of 2008 and we're gonna fly right into the next storm. In 1998, Wall Street got together and bailed out a hedge fund. In 2008, the central banks got together and bailed out Wall Street. Who's gonna bail out the central banks? In other words, the point is each crisis is bigger than the one before. The uh, intervention gets elevated, larger dollar amounts. And are we now at the point where there's no one left to bail us out? And uh, one of the questions I'm asked most frequently is, okay, Jim, I kind of follow your analysis on how risk works and how com complexity theory is in capital markets, how that works, but where's the crisis coming from? What's gonna be the catalyst? It's actually a long list. Now, student loans, there are $1.6 trillion worth of student loans. So this will go, and kind of this gets to your point, Francis, you know, how does the, how do capital markets and, and money markets and Fed policy kind of leach into to debt and deficits? Uh, so when, um, you know, a lender, credit union or anybody, a university makes a loan to a student and the treasury uh, guarantees that loan, which they do, it's off budget. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's not strictly a derivative, but it is non-transparent. So then the student defaults um, and the credit union, the lender simply turns to the treasury and said, here's, here's your loan file, pay me. And the treasury pays the lender because they've guaranteed the loan. And uh, now it's on the treasury. But until that point, that loss is not on the books of the United States government. That loss is not part of the deficit. But when the treasury writes the check to make good on the guarantee, it does go into the deficit. So we think deficits are high now, but there's this you know, trillion dollar tsunami of student loan losses that's going to pile on top of the structural deficits and make it even worse. So all these things are, you know, I'm, I spend all my time analyzing these things. I see them all, I can describe them. I can see how they're gonna converge into, into a worse crisis. But in the short run, people either ignore them or they just don't know anything about them. Why, but why would Bernie Sanders even suggest that? And by the way, he's not alone. I think the other candidates have, you know, Elizabeth Warren and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, one way or another, have suggested that they would do something similar, that we need student loan relief, and that ends up going onto the budget and, and onto the taxpayers. Uh, but there's a school of economics, and I talk about this in, uh, um, in chapter five of my book. Um, it's called Modern Monetary Theory, uh, MMT for short. Everyday viewers, everyday people to know anything about it, but more to the point, economists don't know anything about it. This is a new school of economics, if you want to think of it that way. So there is this modern monetary theory, but the leading scholar of modern monetary theory is a lady named Stephanie Kelton, who's a professor at the State University of New York, but she's the financial advisor to Bernie Sanders. What modern monetary theory says is that actually there's no limit on the amount you can spend. You can spend as much as you want, uh, and the market will either buy the debt, or if they balk, the Fed will monetize the debt. So how much debt is there relative to the size of the economy? The, this is called the debt to GDP ratio, but mm. the way it's a simple fraction you learn in the fifth grade. How much debt divided by the size of the economy? So in a simple example, if you had uh, $5 trillion of debt and a $10 trillion economy, that fraction would be one half. So you would mm. say the debt to GDP ratio is one half or 50%. Today, the debt is larger than the economy. Yeah. That ratio is over 100%. We had round numbers, about $23 trillion of debt and about a $22 trillion economy. So the, the ratio is about 105%, highest since World War II. That troubles me, it troubles other economists. But my friend Stephanie says, what's the problem? You could take it to 150%. 200%, 250%. By the way, that's where Japan is. Japan's at 250%. Greece is uh, 175% or so. Italy's uh, 135%. They're all still standing. If you go to the Ginza, you know, it looks like Times Square. So you don't see visible signs of stress. 
And, uh, and here's the irony. Ben Bernanke would absolutely not agree with this theory, and he, he said so publicly. But uh, Professor Kelton says to Ber Bernanke, you proved our point. You were the one who took the Fed's balance sheet and quadrupled it from 800 billion to 4.5 trillion or so. You proved that you can print trillions of dollars of money without causing inflation, without causing high interest rates, without causing a run on the bank. So all we're saying is, you know, you did it to prop up Jamie Dimon's bonus. We wanted to do it to forgive student loans. We may have, we may have different policy objectives, but the process is the same. What's the problem? Now, of all the things I've debated, I've, for years I was de dragged into Bitcoin versus gold debates, which I thought were silly. I mean, I don't like Bitcoin, I do like gold, but it's like fish versus bicycles. I mean, the debate never made sense to me, even though I did a lot of them. Uh, of all the things I've had to rebut, this was actually the most difficult because it's superficially appealing. First of all, legally it is true that the Fed can take their balance sheet as high as they want. There's no legal limit on the Fed's ability to print money. Uh, it is true that Japan has a much higher debt to GDP ratio and they're still standing. Um, it is true that the, the Treasury can borrow as much as they want, subject to periodic increases in the debt ceiling, which have never been uh, denied. Um, and the Fed can monetize the debt. So all the elements of the thesis are actually correct. So how do you refute it? Um, and the, the answer is that legally it can be done. Uh, and if your goal is to print a lot of money and uh, you know, forgive student loans or give a guaranteed job or guaranteed basic income, uh, whatever it is, in theory you could do that. But there is an invisible psychological boundary. And this is what the modern monetary theorists don't understand, and I don't think Ben Bernanke understands it. There comes a time when people wake up and they say, you know, I don't know what's going on here, I don't have a PhD, but get me out of the dollar. Uh, it doesn't, and so, you know, I'll, I'll buy gold, I'll, I'll buy silver, land, oil, natural resources, I'll buy a new car, buy a house. Get me out of the dollar into something tangible mm. because I no longer trust the monetary authorities. I no longer trust the Congress. Uh, I can't believe that you're going to spend this much money without ceiling, without limit, uh, without causing inflation. My inflationary expectations will go up. And the way to deal with that is to buy hard assets, starting with gold, but not exclusively gold. There, as I say, land real estate, um, and natural resources, they're all, good, uh, they're all good substitutes. At that point, interest rates will skyrocket. All of a sudden, the bond market will have difficulty selling it. The, the, you know, the president of the Congress could take away some of the Fed's independence. All these assumptions could come crashing down very quickly, very unexpectedly, and that's the problem with the theory. The inflation peaked around 9%, but it has been coming down. It's still too high. It's still way above the Fed's target. They say we want 2%, but I've never felt that 2% was the right target for inflation. I always thought it should be zero. If you believe in price stability, you wouldn't want any inflation and you wouldn't want any deflation. You would want price stability. Now, of course, you're never going to get it exactly there, but the target in that world would be zero. Maybe a little bit below, a little bit above, but you'd always be steering to zero. That means you're not stealing anyone's money through inflation. You're not enriching creditors through deflation. You're not distorting the allocation of capital by either one. You're just saying we want stable money. That's kind of the Fed's job. Then the question is, why is it 2%? And you know, I disagree with Milton Friedman on a lot of things, but Milton Friedman said zero. He didn't think it should be 2%. He thought zero was the right number. I agree with that. So why is it 2%? Well, the Fed has a rationale. Um, the rationale is every now and then you have to cut interest rates to stimulate the economy, bail out the stock market. You just need a rate cut. And the evidence is pretty good that negative rates don't work. They have been tried for years in Japan, Switzerland, uh, I believe Sweden for a while, um, and, and the ECB, uh, but they don't do anything. They don't uh, stimulate. In fact, they often do the opposite of what they're intended to do. Let me give you a concrete example. So the idea is if I cut interest rates you know, lower and lower, as a saver or an investor, I'm going to say, well, I don't like those low yields, um, you know, I put money in the bank, I only get you know, a quarter of 1% or half of 1% or whatever. So I'll go buy some treasury notes or I'll go buy some stocks. And that's called the portfolio channel effect. In other words, by keeping rates so low, you make simple savings and liquid investments unattractive and you drive investors to other investments, housing, stocks, bonds, whatever, 
commodities perhaps, and then that creates a wealth effect. And if my assets go up, I feel more prosperous, and maybe I spend more money and that helps the economy, et cetera, et cetera. That's the theory. It's all garbage, by the way, but there's, there's very little evidence for the wealth effect. I mean, yeah, assets go up, people feel a little better about it, but the idea that they turn around and spend more money does not hold up. Uh, the people with the most assets tend to have the most discretionary income and you know once you got a couple of cars and a couple of houses you know and a, a decent wardrobe you're actually going to go spend more money well probably not you'll probably save it or invest it I'm not saying those are bad things but the idea that it stimulates the economy is not true but if you follow the theory and say okay lower rates force you into to asset purchases etc wouldn't negative rates do even more of that because what's what happens with a negative rate you have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank and at a negative one percent interest rate i take on the on the government or the treasury or the bank i'm taking a thousand dollars a year i'm taking one percent out of your account so you're sitting there you just say hey, i just want to save a hundred thousand dollars that's all i want but with a negative rate it goes 99 98 97 and the idea there is well now you're really going to spend your money because it's kind of use it or lose it again these are the kind of theories but let me kind of ground that in the real world a little bit. What do people actually think? When they see negative rates, they, people say to themselves, huh, there must be deflation coming. You know, the economy must be in really bad shape. Deflation must be getting the upper hand. Why else would they go to negative rates if they weren't worried about deflation? And if they are worried about deflation, and they are, then I'm going to say more. I mean, far from getting people to spend, uh, remember, the dollar is worth more in a deflationary world your dollars are actually worth more. In real terms, a dollar can be, you're just a bank account, can be your best performing investment in a deflationary world. If, if you have 2% deflation, then the real value of a, of a savings account with zero interest goes up 2%. And that's probably better than what stocks are doing in that world. So people act rationally. They say, okay, we have negative rates. Central bank must be worried about deflation. If they're worried, I'm worried. And I'm gonna say more because first of all, those savings will do well in deflation. Uh, you know, I need, I need to be prepared for that. The last thing I want to do is spend. If prices are going down, why would I spend? I'll wait six months to get a cheaper price. So in other words, real world behavior is the exact opposite of what central bankers predict. Central bankers predict, use it or lose it, you'll go spend the money because I'm going to take it away. But real people say, no, I'm going to save more because you're signaling to me that the value of the money is going up because you're worried about deflation and prices are coming down. So what's the rush? So for all those reasons, negative rates don't work. Now, in theory, cutting rates from five to four to three to two down to zero does perhaps have some stimulative effect, not as much as people think. Uh, and so the Fed says, well, we don't want to start with zero. If we start with zero, if that's our target and negative doesn't work and the economy goes into a recession, how do we stimulate the economy? We can't go below zero, but we can't cut rates because we're at zero. So they believe that they ought to keep rates around 2%. Now, as inflation is about 2%, interest rates are about 2%. And that gives you two points of cuts. You could do in 25 basis point rate cuts, you could do eight cuts. You know, it's a full year of rate cuts from you know, two to one and three quarters, one and a half, one and a quarter, et cetera. You could do eight 25 basis point rate cuts with 2%. So the Fed says our target rate is 2% because we need a little cushion in case we have to cut. And if we're at zero, we don't have a cushion we can't cut. That's what they say. The reality is the following. Uh, and the way I explain this, it's like a little kid, like a nine-year-old kid and his, his mother leaves her purse around and the kid goes in the purse and sees there's $50 in the purse. And he says, well, even an eight-year-old say, well, if I steal the $50, mom's gonna catch me and I'm gonna be in trouble. But if I take a couple bucks, she won't notice. Like she's not counting the dollars every day. And the Fed's idea is if I steal 2% from you, you won't notice. 10%, yeah, you'll be up in arms. You'll be driving tractors up the steps of the Fed the way they did in 1980. But 2%, you kind of won't notice. Well, what's the math of 2%? 2% cuts the value of the dollar in half in 35 years. It cuts it in half again in another 35 years. Bear in mind, you're starting from down half. So in a typical lifetime of 70 years, at 2%, the dollar is going to lose 75% of its purchasing power. So in 70 years, typical lifetime, your dollar loses 75% of its purchasing power at 2%. And that's really the point because 2% year in, year out, probably not enough to feel, but it's insidious. And by doing it 
for a long enough period of time, you destroy the purchasing power of the dollar. And that's what they really want to do. Why? Because the federal debt is nominal. The debt is nominal. If I owe you a dollar, I owe you a dollar. Whether in real terms, it's a dollar five or 95 cents, that's separate, but I owe you the buck. Well, if you can destroy the purchasing power of the dollar, you're actually reducing the real value of the debt. People say America has never defaulted on its debt. Well, first of all, that's not true. It's not a true statement. But the easiest, quietest, stealthiest way to default is inflation. It's like, hey, here's your billion dollars back. You know, good luck buying a loaf of bread because I've destroyed the value of the dollar. Now, 3% will do it in about 23 years, which means that you'll destroy 75% of the purchasing power in 46 years, not 70 years. So on 4%, 5%, et cetera. At 10%, you cut the value of the dollar in half in seven years. People like to bang the table and say, you know, since since the creation of the Fed in 1913, the dollar has lost 95% of its purchasing power. Well, that's a true statement, but you don't need 110 years. We lost 50% in five years between 1977 and 1982. So inflation is insidious. It is a tax. It is a form of theft. But like the kid with the mother's wallet, if you keep the theft you know, in small little bites, but do it long enough, you can get the whole thing and no one will notice. So they say we want 2% because we want to be able to cut if we have to. But the real reason is we want to basically erode the value of the debt and erode the purchasing power of the dollar in ways that you don't notice. And, and they can be very patient. That's how they do it. So now back to the BRICS. They yeah. replicated the World Bank. They replicated the IMF. Now they're coming out with a new currency. BRICS currency. Now here's where here's where it gets really interesting. And I tell people, I said, if you want to understand this, uh, it took me a long time to figure this out. I mean, I was just like slaving over it. But I said, if you want to understand this, you have to stop thinking like an American. You have to start thinking like a Russian. This is the kind of thing that pretty much only Russia could come up with. So what is the BRICS currency? And by the way, I don't know if they're going to call it a BRIC. I'm saying BRIC for convenience. It doesn't matter what they call it, but I just call it a BRIC for the time being. But they'll, they'll come up with a name. Who knows? The value of the BRIC is not determined with reference to any other currency. It's determined with reference to gold by weight of gold. And I don't know the weight. They'll pick one. But again, it doesn't matter because now we're back to Aristotle's transitive law. This is the key. This unlocks the whole thing because Aristotle said, you know, if A equals B equals C, then A equals C. The B can drop out. It's not even arithmetic. It's it's logic. It's called the transitive law. I'm, I'm, I'm certain that Aristotle invented it. If any Greek scholars know an earlier source, let me know. So what the BRICS have done is they have dodged the biggest bullet, the thing that caused Bretton Woods ultimately to fail, the thing that potentially stands in the way of all this. They've defined their currency by weight of gold. Now, a weight of gold has a dollar value, right? So A equals B equals C. One brick equals one, could be an ounce or a kilo, it doesn't matter. Call it an ounce. One brick equals one ounce of gold equals today, 1970. Well, through the transitive law, drop out the B and one brick equals 1970, $1,970. But that's constant. I mean, that logic works for a moment in time, but it's not fixed because the price of gold is going to fluctuate daily, minute by minute, right? So what's going to happen is the dollar gold call it exchange rate, the dollar price of gold. So the LBMA, the COMEX, the London Metals Exchange, you know, JP Morgan on allocated forward contracts, the whole huge gold market in dollars is still going to exist. In fact, uh, the BRICS want it to exist. And if, if I could just digress for one minute, I've never seen an international monetary economic problem that has created more confusion. I won't say misinformation, that's a little try, but just confusion or maybe deliberate hyperbole than this one. Because let me tell you what this is not. I'm going to tell you what it is, but it's important to know what it's not. This is not the petro yuan. This is not the petro ruble. This is not a gold back yuan. This is not a gold standard. This is not the end of the US dollar. It's not the end of the euro. It's not the end of the world. It's not any of those things, but that's what everyone's running around on websites or whatever shouting. It's none of those things. In fact, quite the opposite. And this is where the Russian mentality comes in. The BRICS want the dollar to be around. They want the dollar gold market to exist. 
because they get the free ride. The dollar has to do all the dirty work in the gold space and bricks get the free ride by declaring one brick equal to a weight of gold. Again, weight's the key. They just let the dollar gold market go wherever it goes and the brick is worth an ounce or whatever, kilo, whatever. And uh, yeah, the dollar equivalent under the transit of law changes, but they're not pegged to the dollar. They're not fighting that fight. In other words, the bricks get to free ride on the dollar gold system and they want that system they don't want it to go away because they get the benefit of a gold value now think of what the bricks don't have to do in this scenario they don't have to buy gold they don't even have to own gold they do but no one in the world has enough gold to back a currency this currency the brick will not be redeemable into gold now maybe there's a dealer somewhere who will take it that's between you and, and the dealer but it's not like you're gonna be able to march down to the People's Bank of China with a pile of bricks and say, give me the gold. They're not gonna do it. So it's not redeemable. They're not gonna make a market. They're not gonna maintain a value because they don't have to, because it's by weight. They just get to sit back and piggyback on the dollar gold system and let the dollar do all the dirty work with one twist. And this is, here's the Russian contribution. So you don't have to close your capital account, you can close it, open it, whatever. You don't have to buy gold, you don't have to make a market. You don't, you don't even need that much gold. You just say, this is the ultimate fiat currency. The word fiat in Latin means I say so. Well, they, they say so, and there it is. Basically, this is a bet. This is a bet that the dollar is going to collapse against gold over time, over time. <laughs> I think that's a very good bet. This is not a three month forecast. I'm not saying gold is going to go up or down the next week, who knows? But over time, now we're into what? Debt to GDP ratios, annual deficits, uh, dare I say, modern monetary theory. I mean, all, the, all these ideas are ruining the dollar and everyone can see it, but not yet. And so if you want to launch this new currency and you say, hey, long term, the dollar is going to collapse in terms of gold, I'll hook my horse to this wagon called gold by weight and I'll just reap the benefits and mm -hmm. I don't have to do a thing. And so that you're defining it by weight. So you, you know, the, the dollar gold market goes where it goes, but you don't really have to worry about it because you're, you're anchored to weight. But here's, here's the twist. Uh, and this is how it's going to play out. Now you're the United States. So you're like, looks like I've been painted into a corner. What can I do? Well, one of the things you could do, I've told the treasury this for years, they don't listen. I mean, they invite me in, but they don't listen. One of the things you could do is buy gold. But what happens when the United States buys gold? The dollar price of gold goes up and the brick gets stronger and the dollar gets weaker. Checkmate. In other words, the U.S. is now in a box where you can't even get out of it by buying gold because you're going to you're going to weaken your own currency relative to gold in the process and the bricks are just going to sit there and not lift a finger so it's genius i i got to credit the russians i'm not saying the chinese couldn't think of something like this but this has got russia's fingerprints all over it okay people have been talking about this for 20 years you know the great reset uh, the end of the dollar or the collapse of the dollar or gold to the moon etc and it's never played out and the reason or some of the ones which is the dollar has these huge embedded advantages in the form of its reserve currency status not because everyone loves the dollar or they even love the united states but because we have the only uh, bond market big enough to absorb global savings the u.s treasury market is huge it is liquid but it's got a whole infrastructure uh primary dealers that bid at auction, uh, when issue trading, settlement, clearance, futures hedging, options hedging, uh, depository trust corporation, settlement, on and on and on. It's got this huge infrastructure of you know, laws, rules, and regulations that they've been building for a long time. I would say 237 um, you know, years since uh, Alexander Hamilton. But above all, it has the rule of law that people just trust it. Don't have to like the dollar, don't have to like the United States, but you trust the market. The U.S., in response to the war in Ukraine, broke the trust. They froze the U.S. Treasury assets of the Central Bank of Russia. Unprecedented. And I'm, I'm a sanctions expert. I work for the intelligence. Supply chain is not part of the economy. Supply chain is the economy. And I was, if you want to understand the economy, you're, you're really talking about the supply chain at every aspect. You know, something as simple as a, a loaf of bread. You know, you buy a loaf of bread at the grocery store. Like, okay, well, I guess it came from a baker and I guess they took it from the bakery to the store by truck. So there's a supply chain. Well, that's about as simple a version of the supply chain as you can imagine. You have to just start going from there. It's like, well, did the bread come in a plastic wrapper or a paper wrapper? Well, that wrapper came from somebody. Where'd the truck come from? Well, obviously a truck manufacturer 
where the driver would come from. Somebody had to make a career choice and and be trained. And what about the diesel fuel in the truck? You know, that, well, that came from refinery and that came from oil exploration. Uh, then you get back to the baker and it's like, oh, well, I guess he had an oven or she had an oven. You know, where did that come from? And then you find out that the ovens are, you know, industrial ovens have parts from 25 different countries and, and so forth. Well, without belaboring that point, you get back to the farmer and the wheat and the fertilizer and and everything else and really what's called the extended supply chain and you're like wait a second that's a huge number of countries a huge number of imports and a big part of the economy which it is and then every link in that supply chain i described has its own supply chain behind it to get to source materials and intermediate manufacturing and so forth and then that's for a loaf of bread well, what about your car, your furniture, your clothes, and, and, and on and on and on. Once you start thinking about what supply chains are, you realize it's just the cardiopulmonary system of the entire global economy. So, you know, the supply chain book shines a light on the entire global economic process. And I have whole chapters on that talk about China, the war in Ukraine, and climate change. And you say, well, yeah, the interesting topics, but what do China, Russia, and climate change have to do with the supply chain? Well, the answer is they are, you know, kind of global macro earthquakes. Uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine led to sanctions against Russia that affect everything, you know, imports, exports, strategic materials, semiconductors, uh, fertilizer, oil, natural gas, et cetera. Again, you're saying, well, okay, Boeing makes aircraft, they need titanium and aluminum. Where does that come from? Turns out about 30% of it comes from Russia. So how are you going to keep the Boeing assembly line going when you're shutting down strategic metals from Russia? It can go kind of on and on there. China, you know, everyone says, well, they slowed down because of the zero COVID policy. And that certainly has been detrimental to their economy. Shanghai, a city of 26 million people, Beijing, a city of 22 million people, they were both locked down entirely. When I say entirely, you know, no transportation in or out, uh, nobody on the streets. You had some essential workers, people had to get to work. You had to have a COVID uh, test, a negative result uh, that was not more than two days old. Uh, so these were extreme lockdowns and obviously very, very detrimental to the economy. Um, now, those have died down a little bit, and China's saying, now we're going to relax our zero COVID policy a little bit. So what's new? Why are supply chains breaking down? Kind of what's new about the supply chain that makes it different than any other period in the history of the world? And what's new were, were two things, and they arose around 1989. The first was you had a combination of increased computing power, algorithms, artificial intelligence, better data collections, a new model. So you suddenly had the, the computational telecommunications and data and mathematical tools to be a lot more sophisticated about how you handle the supply chain. But the second thing that happened at the same time was 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, 1991, the uh, collapse the demise of the former Soviet Union, which gave rise to new trading partners in uh, both in Eastern Europe, where they were no longer behind the the Iron Curtain, you know, Poland and Romania and uh, Hungary and, um, and many other countries. And at the same time, you had the rise of China. China did have a fairly high growth period in the 1980s, but um, nothing like we see today. And it all came crashing down in 1989 with the T Tiananmen Square massacre. And that really shut down US-China relations, not fully, but there was, you know, there was no, there was no Western investment coming into China. The two countries were distant. Well, that ended around 1992. Deng Xiaoping did what he called the Southern Tour, where he reaffirmed China's commitment to capitalist principles. They weren't overthrowing communism, but they were embracing capitalist market ideas. There was a thaw in U.S. relations. And then it was like, you know, no holds barred. Then, then that's when the U.S. investment really did pour in. So, so all in a, a short period between uh, 1989 and 1992, um, you had the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Soviet Union, new republics. China kind of re-enters the game, and all this this was this was globalization. So now all of a sudden you had the science I described, you know, computing and artificial intelligence and applied math and a true global market. So now now the supply chains could go 9,000 miles from Chongqing to New York or from, uh, you know, Shanghai to Seattle or, you know, London to, uh, to to Hong Kong, of course. So this was true globalization, much larger scale, much, much longer supply chains. 
and it worked. And so this was a period I call supply chain 1.0, 30 year period from 1989 to 2019. Now, why did it break down around 2019? Three things, a lot of people look at the pandemic and they go, oh yeah, COVID, that disrupted everything. That was the problem. And some people look at the war in Ukraine and the Russian sanctions and go, that was the problem. And they both made it worse. They both made it worse, no doubt about it, made the supply chain worse. But it really started in 2018 with Trump's tariffs on China. So he put, uh, Trump put tariffs on appliances and solar panels. Well, China didn't stand still for that. So China said, well, what can we do to strike back? Well, at the time, China was and is the world's largest importer of soybeans. They need the protein. They don't have enough. The U.S. and Brazil are the two largest exporters of soybeans. Well, China was buying all their soybeans from the United States because they were trying to reduce the trade deficit. We were buying so much stuff from them. And China said, well, what can we buy from the U.S. just to kind of balance the books a little bit? And the answer was soybeans. Well, when Trump put the tariffs on, China redirected all of their soybean orders to Brazil. They stopped buying U.S. soybeans and they bought them all from Brazil. Well, there's a lot more to that than a phone call. You got vessels and dry bulk carriers and uh, transportation lanes and port facilities. And, you know, if you're Brazil and you get all these orders, you know, you got to get trucks to get the soybeans to the ports. You got to open up port facilities, etc. The point is, this is a major, major shift in global logistics just to change the order book from the US to Brazil. Beyond that, people involved in this, they don't want six month contracts, they want five year contracts or at least three year contracts and they got them. And so now all of a sudden China's buying all their soybeans from Brazil, but this scramble of global supply chains. Now, what are the US farmers doing? We're still growing the soybeans, we can't sell them to China. Well, it turns out the Netherlands needed them. So, okay, we'll sell them to the Netherlands and distribute them to Europe, which they did. And then this went on and on because Trump put more tariffs on to retaliate. China took more actions against the United States, canceled purchase. So, and it escalated from there. Now, again, COVID made it worse. The war in Ukraine made it worse. But it, it's very clear that that's where it started. So that's why I use 2019 as just, you know, kind of an arbitrary date for the 30 year period of supply chain 1.0. Now, we're getting to supply chain 2.0, but we're not there yet. We're in this like messy, in between, inefficient, muddling through period where things are broken, but they haven't, they'll never be put back together the way they were, but we haven't produced or created the new model supply chain. We're just muddling through and with a lot of disruption, a lot of empty shelves. You have to understand, it took us 30 years to build this. We blew it up in about three years. It's not going to come back overnight. It's going to take five or 10 years, or maybe longer to rebuild in, in some form. I'm going to spend $50 billion to create 51% of the mining capacity in the world. And I'm going to steal all the Bitcoin in the world and take down the Western financial system. First of all, there's no such thing as cryptocurrency. There are a thousand cryptocurrencies. In other words, you cannot speak generically about cryptocurrencies. These people, Jim Rickards hates cryptocurrencies. That's not true. I really, really dislike Bitcoin, and I'll tell you why. But there are cryptocurrencies out there that I think are very interesting and, and worth uh, your consideration. Um, I'm for it. I'm against it. Cryptocurrency is, means nothing. You have to talk about the specific currency. And I'm, uh, and I'm here I'm showing uh, Bitcoin, uh, Litecoin, Monero, and Ether. By the way, isn't it fascinating how the graphical representation of cryptocurrencies is always a gold or silver coin? Um, you know, Bitcoin's gold and Litecoin's silver, Monero's both, and Ether is, is gold. I mean, what are they trying to say? I think that psychologically what they're saying is, well, this is, this is nothing, but if we pretend, if we pretend it's a gold coin, then someone will buy it. Uh, but I, I just find this a little bit of an aside. But no, it's the same thing is true with fiat currencies. You can't be... Uh, like or dislike fiat currencies generically. Some people do because they just hate central banks. I understand that. But it's a big difference between a, uh, a uh, Venezuelan Bolivar and, uh, Bolivar and a, a euro, big difference between a Zimbabwe dollar and a U.S. dollar. So in other words, don't talk to me about cryptocurrencies. Tell me what specific one you want to talk about, and that's a more interesting conversation. I think it's really important because this, this field is so muddied. The conversation is so muddied. People not distinguishing between blockchain and currency, not, not distinguishing between different types of currencies, et cetera. I think we need to step back, take a deep breath, and be rigorous in our analysis and think about what we're actually talking about. There's no such thing as a blockchain. There are hundreds of blockchains. In other words, every currency, every token, 
every um, so-called smart contract, if you're using Ether, has a different blockchain. So there are at least hundreds, perhaps thousands of blockchains, new ones being created every day. So again, don't talk to me about blockchain. Tell me which specific blockchain you're talking about because they're not all the same, and this is critical. The main difference, there are, there are many differences in this blockchain technology, but the main difference is validation. Because remember, the whole idea, the whole idea uh, of cryptocurrencies and blockchain and the original Bitcoin and what Satoshi Nakamoto came up with is that we're, not, we're going to have a trustless system. We're not going to trust banks. We're not going to trust clearing houses. We're not going to trust exchanges. We're not going to trust central banks. We're not going to trust anybody. We're going to have a decentralized system that a community can validate, and we don't have to rely on anybody in particular. That was the original idea. So the question is, what's your method of validation? And that's what distinguishes one blockchain from the other. So there's, there, I've listed four of them here, but there are others. Proof of work, that's what blockchain uses. And you know what the work is? You gotta like factor these, you know, uh, 87 digit uh, prime numbers uh, into, or numbers into prime factors. Uh, it's a lot of computer crunching, completely clunky, completely inefficient, non-sustainable. I'll talk about that in a second, but that's Bitcoin. There's something else called proof of stake, meaning you actually, this is what Ether is based on, you demonstrate that you have a certain percentage of the processing power, so you step up based on your stake. There's proof of space. Uh, space is storage space on a hard drive, so I get to vote on the blockchain. I get to vote on validating the blockchain because I've decided to devote a certain amount of my hard drive to that process. That's, there's a new coin called Spacement. Uh, and then there's the Byzantine Agreement, a Byzantine Agreement. Um, there's something, there's a version of that called the Federated Byzantine Agreement, uh, which uh, I uh, personally uh, think is the best, um, much, more, uh, uh, much more robust to some of the problems we're talking about. And there are others. But the point is, don't talk about blockchain. Say, OK, what's your, what's your governance model? What's your validation model? Uh, et cetera, and then, and then ask yourself, is that sustainable? Is that robust? Will that resist an attack? Are your, are your cryptocurrencies going to be stolen? These are the questions you have to ask yourself, and there are no generic answers, so I, I cannot emphasize enough. Coin by coin, I hate to use the word coin, um, you know, whatever, <laughs> token by token, uh, blockchain by blockchain, be rigorous and ask yourself what's sustainable. Now, um, Bitcoin, Ripple, and Ether, and some of these other cryptocurrencies, not all of them, not all of them, but the, but the best known are going to fail. When I say fail, they're going to, you know, Bitcoin might have a, um, a $200 value as a uh, token for criminals, and criminals and terrorists might, might find a, a, a use case at about $200 per Bitcoin, but they're basically not going to be anywhere ne near where they are today. Why do I say that? I don't want to make a claim without backing it up. The first point is they're non-scalable. Transaction times are slow, uh, and then when you say that to Bitcoin people, they go, aha, the Lightning Network is right around the corner. You know, Lightning's going to, we'll see. You know, they said that about Segregated Witness. They said that about some of these other solutions. They, they don't seem to get community support. They keep forking the Bitcoin, meaning one day you wake up and there's two blockchains instead of one, or whatever happened to that whole idea that we weren't going to have inflation, that we weren't going to pull new cryptos out of thin air. But um, these solutions, you have to understand what the solution is. So what they're saying is nobody has a solution for the inherent slowness, clunkiness, non-scalability of the original Bitcoin blockchain. There's no solution for that. So when you hear about solutions, what are they? Well, what they're saying is take a bunch of transactions offline. So everybody in the room could form a group or let's say every, every coffee shop in Brooklyn, New York, or every coffee shop in Vancouver could form a group. And all the people who want to buy coffee would join that group. And we would agree, so we're in our own little bubble over here, and we would agree that all of our Bitcoin transactions uh, among each other are, don't go on the blockchain. They just get settled in this sort of separate cloud over here. And then we net them out. So, you know, I pay you five Bitcoin, and you pay the person next to you four, and he pays the lady in the back of the room 10, and she pays me seven. And we add all, we net it out, and then periodically, and it could be daily, weekly, monthly, or whatever, we net all this stuff out, and then we take that net and we put that on the blockchain. So that the amount of transactions that have to go on the blockchain is greatly reduced, that's true. But what are, what are we doing? We've created our own network. I gotta trust the coffee shops. How do I know they're not gonna steal my money? In other words, it's only a solution because you're completely negating the original idea. 
Oh, they'll be sure. If you want to, if you want to tear up the, tear up the original idea and start over, that's fine. But don't tell me you're adhering to the idea of a decentralized, trustless network, because you're not. All you've done is create another network. Somebody, uh, you know, I get trolled on Twitter all the time. People tell me I'm an idiot and I don't know technology and all that stuff. And then my more sour moves, I tell them I was coding uh, before they were born. But uh, as far as uh, as far as some of these um, these things are concerned. Uh, somebody said, well, you don't understand payment channels. And uh, I actually do. And I said, yeah, I understand payment channels. Uh, we, we had those in the 50s. They were called party lines, we, which is, you know, you pick up the phone and someone's talking. You've got to ask them to get off the phone so you could go. In other words, there was an AT&T network, at least in the United States, but other people could jump in on this little side thing. You know, that's all it is. These are party lines. So uh, that, that doesn't work. Non-sustainable. The energy usage to do, to solve the problem and make the proof of work in Bitcoin is now greater than the annual energy output of Ireland. Imagine taking all the electricity used in Ireland in a year, and that's how much we have to use to, to crunch numbers. By the way, every applied mathematician will tell you that prime factoring is a trivial problem. It, it's like an uninteresting, not an uninteresting problem, but it takes a lot of computing power to do it because the numbers are so big and the possibilities are so great. So we're just wasting the entire electrical usage of Ireland in a few years, it's going to be the entire electrical usage of Japan. Who thinks, who in this room thinks that governments are going to allow Bitcoin miners to use as much electricity in a year as the entire country of Japan, the third largest economy in the world? That's not going to happen. It's, you know it's not going to happen. Uh, it's not very green. It's not very, it's completely wasteful. In other words, it, it, can't, it can't happen. So that's why I say it's not sustainable. It's going to hit a wall. Non-regulated, you know, I don't have to remind you of all the frauds, new ones popping up every day. Um, and it's not just exchanges. Uh, exchanges are, how do exchanges work? Well, you know, you, I want to go to a Bitcoin exchange. Well, you got to go and you got to open an account, just like Merrill Lynch or Charles Schwab, right? So, uh, you know, or, or, T, or Toronto Dominion. So you go, you give me your name, your address, your social security number, your bank wire information, give them all that information, and then send them dollars and they say, okay, you got some Bitcoin, here's your confirmation. Really, how do I know you didn't just take my dollars and send me a phony baloney confirmation? How do I know you're not um, you know, a, a Ponzi, you're using new money to pay off the old money? How do I know you're not Bernie Madoff in, uh, you know, with, a, with a computer engineering degree? Uh, how do I know you're not a bucket shop? How do I know any of those things? The answer is you don't. Uh, so good luck with that. Uh, not to mention Bitcoin whales. They, they estimate there are 1,000 people who control 40% of the Bitcoin. Now you got millennials buying, you know, one one hundredth of a Bitcoin for, you know, 10 bucks or whatever the math is, 100 bucks. Uh, but you got these, I call them the whales, these thousand people who have 40% of all the Bitcoin. You don't think they have a big vested interest in keeping the price up? And you don't think they wash trade, do wash sales? So A sells to B for 10,000, B sells back for 11,000, A sells back for 12,000, B sells back for 13,000. This is called painting the tape. It's the oldest trick in the book. Um, and there's no profit and loss because we're selling the same Bitcoin back and forth. But what we are doing is creating a ticker that gets the millennials, I shouldn't pick up millennials, the three millennial children, but gets uh, people all over the world, maybe a, a garage mechanic in South Korea took out a home equity loan or hocked his inventory, put his entire life savings into Bitcoin and has now been wiped out and is desperate and suicidal. That's what's going on. It's basically rich people stealing from the poor. Uh, not a good business model in my view. And then finally, uh, there's no use case other than criminals, terrorists, or tax evaders. Why is Bitcoin better than Visa unless you're a criminal? Now, if you're a criminal, I get it. If you're buying child pornography, uh, you want to use the dark web and use some cryptos and all that. And if you try doing that with Visa, you'll probably get a call from the FBI. So I understand why it's good for criminals. But if you're not a criminal, if you're not a tax evader, if you're not buying child pornography, if you're not an arms dealer, if you're not a terrorist, then why is Bitcoin better than Visa? Um, there's really no use case for it other than crime. Um, and then it's non-elastic. And this is uh, important because there's a finite number of Bitcoins, 21 million Bitcoin. They're getting closer to that level every day. When, and everyone's like, this is a good thing because, you know, the problem with central banks is they print all this money and we're going to have inflation. By the way, we haven't had any inflation for the last eight years. Separate issue. I'll come to that if we don't run out of time. But, um, uh, you know, we hate central banks. They print too much money, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we're going to cap the number of Bitcoin. But, but, but money supply has to be elastic. It can't be too elastic. The problem with central bank money is that it's too elastic. Too elastic. 
The reason, by the way, gold is such a good form of money is that it grows slowly. It grows at about the tempo of world growth. It grows at about the tempo of population growth. Not exactly, but close enough that it's the best form of money anyone's ever discovered. But the problem with Bitcoin, when you hit a hard stop, which they will, and the economy keeps growing, but you want to back it with Bitcoin, so here's your money supply and here's your economy, that's inherently deflationary, right? Because each Bitcoin's got to support more and more growth, meaning your Bitcoin is worth more in theory. But the problem is you never get there. Why? Because if you have a deflationary currency, there's no bond market. The money supply grows based on credit, based on loans, based on various forms of borrowing. The money supply is just a foundation and, the, and the, the, the economy grows with credit. Nobody wants to borrow in a form of money that's gonna be more expensive when you pay it back. I'm not talking about interest. That's always part of the equation. But I'm saying the money itself is, um, is worth more when you have to pay back the loan. No one's gonna borrow in that loan, therefore no bond market, therefore no viable form of money. So these are all the reasons why this is gonna hit the wall. I also believe, as I said now twice, that we are on a shift away from treasuries uh, into precious metals as a store of value, which could be a massive injection into that market. And let's not forget that, you know, over the past um, 120 years, right? Anytime 100% of countries that cross over the 130% debt to GDP have defaulted on their debt. And, and it's usually usually due to massive inflation, hyperinflation, instead of outright default. But whether it be a inflationary default or an outright default, every single country over the last 120 years that has gotten to 130% of debt to GDP has never come back. That's where we are. The U.S. government really can't repay its debt and default in my mind is inevitable. And as a result of that, holding U.S. treasuries would be as dumb as building a mud wall. So I think the alternative to the elite is, is gold and it will soar. And um, I don't expect a, an explicit default unless, of course, Saudi Arabia and OPEC dump dollars uh, as the store of value or as the, as the petrodollar, which I believe is highly likely, ultimately. Uh, and then you have a villain to point to for your default. It was OPEC and Xi Jinping and Putin. How could they do it to us? But I think if I were going to make a trend, I would only the only trend I would add to Michael's statement, which I believe both. I think AI is certainly overvalued and, and um, could very well transition out of there as the economy starts money to a transition as uh, the economy begins to slow. But by the same token, I would say precious metals go higher. I agree. But I would also say that we will move into a, a period of time where treasuries are no longer the go-to store of value. Anyways, bottom line is, is that, yeah, I think that he's right. He's spot on. I think that one area is massively overvalued. One area is massively undervalued. And one area, the treasuries, is, is, is going through a once in a, um, in a generation shift of recognition and um, I think it's going to be a very bumpy ride so when we talk about owning precious metals Jesse I don't tell people to do it to get wealthy it is wealth wealth that has outlived every transition two world wars German hyperinflation the Great Depression every pandemic and it will still be wealth when this situation ends too um, and evidenced by the fact that the people who are writing the playbook the central banks well, they're loading up on it as if it was really important. So it's the suppression of the Western paper markets that has enabled them to do this without people catching on because the price hasn't exploded. And in particular in silver. Could we get into an arms race type situation where central banks are all trying to accumulate as much gold as they can and that there might not be enough physical gold to fill their orders at some point? I think that's why they've used the Western suppression to, to run cover for their accumulation, which I would argue has been going on at least since 2017 or 18, when, you know, you saw the repatriation by the central banks from the New York Fed and the Bank of England, starting with the Bundesbank. And in 2018, all of a sudden, those banks bought more gold that year than they did in the 60 years previously combined. That would be like uh, uh, the Dutch National Bank, uh, the uh, Bank of Hungary, Turkey, uh, the Czech National Bank. All of these countries have been on a, a, a buying spree, many, many others uh, on a buying spree, of course, China and, and India and all of those. But uh, look, let, let's just again, like I said earlier, from a historical point of view, using government treasuries and bonds as a savings vehicle is a relatively new concept in the historical context. 
And I think it's fading. And I think that already the, the elite have rediscovered gold is and has always been the premier store of value. And I think it's happening in a big way. And as you mentioned, last, last year, the central banks bought 37 million ounces of gold, a multi-decade record. Over the last 18 months, they bought more than in any time in history. And, you know, so if you talk about this here, you're right. They bought 800 tons so far in the first nine months of, of the year. That's up 14% year over year. Last year being the biggest year on record. And now it's up another 14%. And I think in short, we're on the verge of, of this shift from an in international finance and gold is going to replace the treasuries, I think, as, as the premier store of value. And it, it is happening. And at the same time, these central banks not only have been voraciously accumulating it while using the suppression of the Western paper market to run cover where you have 35 times leverage and you can short the market on paper and buy the physical without really the whole world jumping into it because of price going to the moon and attracting attention. In fact, quite to the opposite, the, the counterintuitive price action and the suppression of the market has enabled these big players to front run what is ultimately going to happen. And um, I, I don't think we've begun to really see anything yet as far as that concern is concerned. These, these traders are always way, way, way ahead of the curve. And when it breaks, it breaks when there just isn't any ability for the Western suppressed markets to suppress in a naked fashion. In other words, it will be far too dangerous to sell short. Let me say what I mean by naked. Right now in silver, as an example, there is 1,700% more paper contracts than there are bars backing those contracts. In other words, it's rehypothecated 17 times. And so if, if for every one real contract that could be delivered in, in physical form, 16 won't be or 17 won't be, you get paper settled is rehypothecated. And that's why we're already beginning to see in China, as an example, the Shanghai Gold Exchange has gold price. Last I looked at about $100 higher than the LBMA or the COMEX price. I don't care what these economists tell you is the justification. In my mind, they are trying to arbitrage slowly whatever is not nailed down. And they've already done a good job at pulling stuff out of the COMEX, out of the LBMA. They're pulling the physical commodities, not just gold and silver. You're seeing the industrial metals too, uh, aluminum and zinc and copper. They're all being accumulated by these nations and they're using the suppression of the Western markets to do it. At the same time, they're selling treasuries. So if anyone wonders why the treasury market experienced its worst year ever and, and, and the yields keep rising and the back end of the curve keeps rising because they're all dumping their long, uh, their long treasuries. And even at a loss, I think they would rather sell them and shift and transition to gold before things get really dirty. So yes, I think that what we will ultimately witness is a, a moment in time where the rehypothecated levered, levered Western paper markets will enable the rest of the world to siphon everything out of the weak hands of the West and it will all move eastward. And when all of the metal is there, or the majority of it, where the Western markets are rendered neutered or a scam um, because of their um, hypothecated model, then you will see other parts of the world establish a more reliable and credible benchmark, whether it be in Abu Dhabi or the Shanghai Gold Exchange or the Moscow Metals Exchange, it will be that portion of the world, those who have been accumulating it all, who produce it all, who understand what it really means. They're going to say, we don't want to buy from your Western system anymore. And we don't believe in your Western system anymore. And in fact, we are going to implement our own system. And, you know, you can see how banks will, will arbitrage for a few cents a share millions and millions and millions of dollars. Well, how about a hundred bucks an ounce? How about putting silver at 50 bucks and watch what happens to all the silver over here that immediately arbitrages over there in a one-time shot to make these bankers very wealthy. And now we have stripped clean all of the physical silver and gold that will be available for, that would have been available for the, for the people in this country who will wake up last minute and say, well, geez, you know, I, I better get something. And, and it will define this market the inability to source product on every level. And that's when the price goes parabolic. The Fed's looking at unemployment. And it's based on the so-called Phillips curve. It says, you know, unemployment's down, inflation's up. If unemployment's up, inflation's down. 
That's the Phillips curve, you know, you can draw it and the Fed's using that to guide policy. The Phillips curve is garbage and it's not a not a personal insult against, you know, Professor Phillips. It's it's the case that there's no empirical support for it. I could give you examples going back to the 1930s of low unemployment, low inflation, which you had in the early 60s. 1930s, we had high unemployment, low inflation, even deflation. Late 1970s, what did we have? High unemployment and high inflation. That was called stagflation. So I can give you examples. If you think of it as a quad chart, you know, unemployment, inflation, you know, fill in the blanks. I could give you all four examples, low, 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 high, high, low, high, high, which means there's no correlation. If you can have any one of them, there's no correlation. So the Phillips curve has no predictive value on its face because the data doesn't back it up. Last time I looked at a Phillips curve it was a flat line, at least where I went to school curves were not flat, but there it is. Now it's worse than that because Unemployment, even if you thought it was a good indicator of something, particularly inflation, it's a lagging indicator or a lagging indicator of a recession, as the case may be. So let's say you're an employer, a business person. I mean, you're, you're an entrepreneur. I start businesses. When you're in a tough spot, when revenues are down and things are slowing down, margins are getting compressed and all that, the last thing you want to do is fire people because it took a while to find them, hire them, train them. You don't want to let them go. You do everything else. Like you turn down the lights, you call your landlord, negotiate a cheaper rent slow pay your creditors, you know, drive a hard bargain on something. You do everything else to maintain your margins. And then only when all else fails, do you start firing people. So first of all, it's a lagging indicator. You're already in the recession before you get around to firing people, number one. Number two, because you held on so long, you tend to do it en masse. It's like, it's not like well, I'm going to fire one person a month for the next year. It's like, I'm going to hang on to all of them. And then, you know, in the U.S., we have a... Uh, a uh, hundred dollar bill. That's our largest denomination. When I was a teenager, the U.S. had a five hundred dollar bill, and they were in circulation. You could you could get them. Um, so they eliminated that in 1968. No more five hundred dollar bill. And from then on, the hundred dollar bill was the largest denomination. But the difference between then and now is that 1968 hundred dollar bill was worth a hundred dollars. Um, if you adjust for inflation, the hundred dollar bill of 1968 is worth about twenty dollars in purchasing power in today's money. So we're already at a point where our largest denomination is worth 20 bucks in purchasing power, at least compared to the 60s, you know, $100 nominally, but, but you know, it's greatly shrunk. So we don't have much cash. And by the way, um, if you want a million dollars in $100 bills, it weighs exactly 22 pounds and it fits in an attache case, million dollars in $100 bills. People look at me funny, they go, Jim, how come you know that? Uh, well, <laughs> first of all, I do know that, but it's really just a math problem because one bill, whether it's a one or a hundred, but I'm using hundreds because the biggest weighs a gram. So, you know, it's, so it's basically uh, you know, t 10 grams or uh, uh, sorry, 10, 10 kilograms, 10 kilos or 22.2 pounds. The point, but we're very far down the road to get them into cash anyway, but you can still do it. You can get your 22 pounds and have your million dollars in cash. So, why do why are they so driven to eliminate cash? What's well, they got to do with the central bank digital currency? Well, now we get into the purpose of the central bank digital currency. And the, the metaphor I've used is that if you want to slaughter pigs, you have to get all the pigs into a cattle chute and run them into the slaughterhouse and then slaughter, slaughter them. You can't just let them, uh, you know, run around. Uh, you got to herd them up and get them into a cattle chute uh, or cows uh, for that matter. Um, and so if they want to slaughter savers and investors, they have to get you into a digital slaughterhouse. And that, that's what digital money is all about. If you can't have cash and you can only have the central bank digital currency, then everyone's got to have a digital account. And once they've got you in the system, of course, they know who you are because it's all digital and they keep the ledger back to the ledger. What can they do? Uh, well, they can uh, impose negative interest rates. Uh, you know, so you have $100,000 at 1% interest, you go away for a year, you come back, you should have $101,000. But if with a negative interest rate of 1%, you go away, come back in a year, and you'd have $99,000. Well, cash is an easy way around that. At least you, know, you can bury in your backyard, but at least you'd have the, uh, uh, the, the $100,000, in my example, um, a year later. But with, with, uh, with a digital account, they can actually take it out of your account, number one. Number two, they can put um, a timestamp or an expiration date on your money and say, okay, here's your money that's uh, in your account. But if you don't spend 10% of it in the next 30 days, we're going to impose a 2% you know, penalty. We're going to take it away, basically, if you don't spend it. 
Oh, what does that do? It kind of forces you to spend it. Is that a kind of stimulus? Um, maybe, I'm not sure. These things don't usually work out as the egghead's plan, but the idea would be uh, if we don't have enough what Keynes called aggregate demand, we'll force people to go buy stuff by telling them if you don't spend it, you lose it, use it or lose it kind of thing. Okay, uh, withholding taxes. Uh, now, again, in the United States, I think it's similar in Australia. If you have a, a, a job, quote unquote, you know, your regular payday, or whatever, they pay you, but they deduct the withholding tax at the source and it's based on the rate. So maybe it's, I don't know, 20%. So you make a thousand dollars, they take out $200 and here's the 800 net to you. And then at the end of the year, they give you a statement and you file your tax return and you claim the withholding and you reconcile your taxes. But that's not true for uh, independent contractors, doctors, lawyers, professionals, writers, uh, anyone who's, who, you know, you earn a living, you work, right, but um, but you don't have any withholding tax, but you still have, the money still goes in your bank account. Well, now they can just impose the tax on your bank account. Say, well, hey, we see your inflows here, you, you know, you make a nice living. We're gonna take 20% of that. Again, send your receipt, tax receipt, and file your tax return and sort it out at the end of the year. Uh, that would come as a shock to a lot of doctors and lawyers. So, uh, so negative interest rates um, and withholding taxes are two things that are hard to impose if in a world of cash and non-central bank digital currencies, but they're easy in a world of no cash and central bank digital currencies. Uh, well, it gets worse. Uh, this is the culmination, just kind of cut to the chase. This is the culmination of the total surveillance state. We already have facial recognition software, very good. It's like your face is like a fingerprint. Everyone's a little different. Um, you say, well, that's okay. I'm gonna put a mask on because you know, COVID and uh, sunglasses and pull a hat down to my um, down my forehead. You'll never see my face. You know what? They have gait recognition software, G-A-I-T, meaning how you walk. Everybody walks differently. It was it all the, was it the Monty Python thing, the mystery of silly walks? Well, silly or not, everybody walks differently and so they can actually digitally identify you just by the way you walk um and so your mask isn't going to help you and and you know with gps uh i have a bunch of what are called faraday sacks they're um uh you know some of them are nice i'm glad they're wallets but they're basically lined with a certain metallic fibers that block radiation so um if you want to turn your cell phone off put it in a Faraday sack, and by the way, do the same with your Easy Pass and any other uh, things sending out you know, radiation, uh, which are ubiquitous. Um, maybe they can't follow you around, but most people don't do that and, and they do. And so with your, your iPhone, um, they know where you are at all times. So you, you may be looking at a map trying to find a good restaurant, but they're tracking you. So they already do that. Um, but now they get, take it a step further. So you're at the point of purchase, you're buying a book. Let's say it's uh, a book that uh, criticizes Kevin Rudd, for example, he's your leading uh, panda hugger down in Australia or in the United States criticizes uh, Joe Biden uh, or something, or, you know, ultra MAGA pre uh, hamburger, whatever it is. Well, oh gee, ultra MAGA, you're, uh, you're an extremist, you're a radical, you're part of the insurrection. Uh, so now we're going to freeze your account or deny the purchase or put you on a watch list or one of our, we just appropriated money to hire 87,000 armed uh, IRS and general revenue service agents. Maybe we'll assign one to you because you bought the wrong book. So now we're into thought control. Uh, we're into um, basically subduing your political enemies because you know, uh, you know, well, if you give money to a certain candidate, political candidate, again, perfectly legal stuff, buy a book, make a donation, that's legal, but they don't like who you're doing it with. And they're, they meaning the government, and they're watching, they know what you're reading and by inference, what you're thinking, who you're giving money to, what causes you support, et cetera, et cetera. And it doesn't take much these days to have some, you know, kind of low IQ spokesperson at the White House label you as an extremist. So this is all, um, this is all governments ever wanted. It was total control of the people. You know, it makes Louis the 14th look like a, 
uh, a very hands-off kind of guy. But Jim, but, Jim the, the government yeah. would never do these things. That you know, the tax office would never target you know, a political group. You know, they would never target a group of people because of donations to, to different causes. They would never target protesters in any way. They would never target someone who's a, you know, doesn't want to get vaccinated in any way. None of these things would ever happen. <laughs> well, uh, I know you're. I know you're being. Uh, uh, actually, very serious, but uh, I, I know that's more rhetorical. The fact is, not only will they happen, they have happened, they are happening. This is the world we live in. That's absolutely the case. And let me give some concrete examples because I don't put stuff like that out there without backing up. So in 2010, the IRS targeted what we called the United States the Tea Party movement. This was the first midterm of President Obama's first term in office. Historically, a time when the uh, president's party loses a lot of seats. It just, it's not even Democrats versus Republicans. It's just a consistent pattern of first term president, first midterm election, they lose seats. Obama lost like, almost a record number of seats, something like 63 or 64 seats versus an historical average uh, closer to 30. Because of uh, people were upset about Obamacare, they were upset about the tax increases, uh, the bailouts coming out of the 2008 global financial crisis favored the rich, hurt the poor. There was just a lot of, and a lot of people were having second thoughts about a, voting for Obama in the first place. So we, we had this Tea Party movement, and they just kicked butt in the 2010 election. Well, so these were springing up everywhere. This was a, a genuine grassroots movement. This, there was no like nationwide top-down organization. Communities were like, hey, let's start our own branch of the Tea Party, etc. And because they were they qualified as non-profit organizations. There's some rules around that, but but you have to apply to the IRS, our Internal Revenue Service, for uh, a designation and a number proving that you're a, a, a non-profit organization. Well, the person in charge of this was slow rolling all the applications. They weren't getting approved. They were entitled to it. That the IRS intervened to squash the formation of Tea Party movements from coast to coast um, for political reasons, plain and simple. Well, that was 12 years ago and there was no central bank digital currency. Imagine how much more powerful that kind of corruption is today. There were a trillion dollars of subprime mortgages. These are mortgages that, you know, no documentation, don't have to prove your income, very non-credit worthy. But there was a there was a bubble mentality, a frenzy and everyone, hey, buy a house and borrow money, fix it up, sell it for twice as much, walk away rich, you know, and everybody was doing it. Mortgage default rates rarely get above 5%. 5% is really high in the mortgage market. So people were saying, you know, smart people like Ben Stein, the financial analyst, but, but the central bank and others were like, well, okay, let's get crazy. Let's assume a 20% default rate, which is which ne has never happened, but just assume that's true. On a trillion dollars of subprime mortgages, a 20% default rate would be a $200 billion loss, which was only slightly higher than the SNL crisis of the 1980s. You know, adjusted for inflation, it would have been a comparable loss. And the attitude was, well, we survived the 80s, we'll survive this. Yeah, it's bad, banks will take losses, stock prices go down a little bit, but we'll survive. What they missed is, yes, there was $1 trillion of uh, subprime mortgages, but there were $6 trillion of derivatives. Yeah. That was invisible. So all of a sudden, 20% of that was $1.2 So you, you create derivatives out of thin air, yeah. Uh, and there's no limit on how many you can have. They're off balance sheet, meaning give me the balance sheet of the company, I won't see them. You have to read the footnotes and then the, the information behind the footnotes. So non-transparent, unregulated, no limit on size. So the, the crisis was actually much worse than anyone realized and then when it started to collapse, the, the, the contagion spread throughout the financial system. My point about 2008, it was because we did not learn the lessons of 1998 and we flew right into 2008 but once again, we have not learned the lessons of 2008, and we're going to fly right into the next storm. In 1998, Wall Street got together and bailed out a hedge fund. In 2008, the central banks got together and bailed out Wall Street. Who's going to bail out the central banks? And was, the point is, each crisis is bigger than the one before. The uh, intervention gets elevated, larger dollar amounts. And are we now at the point where there's no one left to bail us out? And uh, one of the questions I'm asked most frequently is, okay, Jim, I kind of follow your analysis on how risk works and how com complexity theory and capital markets, how that works, but where's the crisis coming from? What's going to be the catalyst? It's actually a long list. Now, student loans, there are $1.6 trillion worth of student loans. So this will go, and kind of this gets to your point, Francis, 
you know, how does the how do capital markets and, and money markets and Fed policy kind of leach into to debt and deficits? Uh, so when um, you know a lender, credit union, or anybody a university makes a loan to a student, and the treasury uh, guarantees that loan, which they do, it's off budget. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's not strictly a derivative, but it is non-transparent. So then the student defaults um, and the credit union, the lender simply turns to the treasury and said, here's, here's your loan file, pay me. And the treasury pays the lender because they've guaranteed the loan. Uh, now it's on the treasury. But until that point, that loss is not on the books of the United States government. That loss is not part of the deficit. But when the treasury writes the check to make good on the guarantee, it does go into the deficit. So we think deficits are high now, but there's this you know, trillion dollar tsunami of student loan losses that's going to pile on top of the structural deficits and make it even worse. So all these things are, you know, I'm, I spend all my time analyzing these things. I see them all, I can describe them. I can see how they're gonna converge into, into a worse crisis. But in the short run, people either ignore them or they just don't know anything about them. Why? But why would Bernie Sanders even suggest that? And by the way, he's not alone. I think the other candidates of, you know, Elizabeth Warren and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, one way or another, have suggested that they would do something similar, that we need student loan relief, and that ends up going onto the budget and, and onto the taxpayers. Uh, but there's a school of economics, and I talked about this in, uh, um, in chapter five of my book. Um, it's called Modern Monetary Theory, uh, MMT for short. Everyday viewers, everyday people to know anything about it, but more to the point, economists don't know anything about it. This is a new school of economics, if you want to think of it that way. So there is this modern monetary theory, but the leading scholar of modern monetary theory is a lady named Stephanie Kelton, who's a professor at the State University of New York. But she's the financial advisor to Bernie Sanders. What modern monetary theory says is that actually there's no limit on the amount you can spend. You can spend as much as you want, uh, and the market will either buy the debt, or if they balk, the Fed will monetize the debt. So how much debt is there relative to the size of the economy? The, this is called the debt to GDP ratio, but mm. the way it's a simple fraction you learn in the fifth grade. How much debt divided by the size of the economy? So in a simple example, if you had uh, $5 trillion of debt and a $10 trillion economy, that fraction would be one half. So you would mm. say the debt to GDP ratio is one half or 50%. Today, the debt is larger than the economy. Yeah. That ratio is over 100%. We had round numbers, about $23 trillion of debt and about a $22 trillion economy. So the, the ratio is about 105% highest since World War II. That troubles me, it troubles other economists. But my friend Stephanie says, what's the problem? You could take it to 150%, 200%, 250%. By the way, that's where Japan is. Japan's at 250%. Greece is uh, 175% or so. Italy's uh, 135%. They're all still standing. If go to the Ginza, you know, it looks like Times Square. So you don't see visible signs of stress. And, uh, and here's the irony. Ben Bernanke would absolutely not agree with this theory, and he, he said so publicly. But uh, Professor Kelton says to Ber Bernanke, you proved our point. You were the one who took the Fed's balance sheet and quadrupled it from 800 billion to 4.5 trillion or so. You proved that you can print trillions of dollars of money without causing inflation, without causing high interest rates, without causing a run on the bank. So all we're saying is, you know, you did it to prop up Jamie Dimon's bonus, we wanted to do it to forgive student loans. We may have we may have different policy objectives, but the process is the same. What's the problem? Now, of all the things I've debated, I've for years I was to, dragged into Bitcoin versus gold debates, which I thought were silly. I mean, I don't like Bitcoin. I do like gold, but it's like fish versus bicycles. I mean, the debate never made sense to me, even though I did a lot of them. Uh, of all the things I've had to rebut, this was actually the most difficult because it's superficially appealing. First of all, legally it is true that the Fed can take their balance sheet as high as they want. There's no legal limit on the Fed's ability to print money. Uh, it is true that Japan has a much higher debt to GDP ratio and they're still standing. Um, it is true that the, the Treasury can borrow as much as they want, subject to periodic increases in the debt ceiling, which have never been uh, denied. Um, and the Fed can monetize the debt. So all the elements of the thesis are actually correct. So how do you refute it? Um, and 
the the answer is that legally it can be done. Uh, and if your goal is to print a lot of money and uh, you know, forgive student loans or give a guaranteed job or guaranteed basic income, uh, whatever it is, in theory you could do that. But there is an invisible psychological boundary. And this is what the modern monetary theorists don't understand, and I don't think Ben Bernanke understands it. There comes a time when people wake up and they say, you know, I don't know what's going on here, I don't have a PhD, but get me out of the dollar. Uh, it doesn't, and so, you know, I'll, I'll buy gold, I'll, I'll buy silver, land, oil, natural resources, I'll buy a new car, buy a house. Get me out of the dollar into something tangible mm. because I no longer trust the monetary authorities. I no longer trust the Congress. Uh, I can't believe that you're going to spend this much money without ceiling, without limit, uh, without causing inflation. My inflationary expectations will go up. And the way to deal with that is to buy hard assets, starting with gold, but not exclusively gold. There, as I say, land real estate, um, natural resources, they're all, good, uh, they're all good substitutes. At that point, interest rates will skyrocket. All of a sudden, the bond market will have difficulty selling it. The, the, you know, the president of the Congress could take away some of the Fed's independence. All these assumptions could come crashing down very quickly, very unexpectedly, and that's the problem with the theory. Uh, what's coming is a very severe recession. The uh, uh, you know monetary tightening uh, on top of a world where growth is deaccelerating, inventories are sky high. You know the funny thing about the supply chain. You know we all remember headline: you know, supply chain is broken down. Uh, you know the, the shelves are bare. So well, all true that that was happening at the time, and that's when I uh, started working on the book. But what a lot of purchasing managers did um, and inventory managers, they they doubled their orders. They said, well, or tripled the orders. They said, well, if the supply chain's breaking down and I want just a normal amount, I better order three times as much or twice as much just to get what I want. And they did. Well, what happened was by the summer, some of that pressure had been alleviated. And here come the shipments into the warehouses that are twice as much or three times as much as what you needed at the exact same time that the Fed was destroying demand. And so demand drops off a cliff, uh, retail sales drop off a cliff, the warehouses go from being empty to being full to the rafters, and now all that merchandise is sitting there. So, uh, you know, Nike, I mean, just many examples. So what, are, what do you do when you're um, in charge of inventory? You cut prices. You, you don't want that inventory. It costs a lot of money to keep it in the warehouses, number one. Number two, a lot of it's seasonal. It's like who wants to buy, you know, summer dress in uh, December? Not too many people. Um, so they just slash prices, uh, and that reduces margins and reduces profits. So we're just kind of flying into the face of all that uh, with the Fed tightening rates into weakness. The, the Fed will be the last to know because they're very model driven and the models are badly flawed, mostly with the Phillips curve and their focus on the unemployment rate, which. Uh, is is not a good measure of um, of what's going on in the labor force. So we're flying into a really bad recession. But you know you've got this pivot narrative. You can't quite get rid of the, some of the buy the dips people are still around. So count on them to you know buy into a, what could be a horrendous bear market. Uh, you got your buy and hold crowd. You know remember in uh, 2000 2001 the Nasdaq dropped 80 percent, and a lot of people got out. But a lot of, they said well just hold on to it. Well it did come back, but it took until. 2015. I mean, it took, that's a long time. A lot of people died in the meantime. You know, you're waiting 14 years to get back to where you were. So, uh, so those people are still around, but there is what I call the pivot crowd. So the Fed pivot is a narrative and it kind of goes like this. Yeah, the Fed's tightening. We see that. Inflation is going to come down really fast. The economy is going to slow down really fast. Both of those things are happening. Inflation, a little less so, but the, the economic slowdown is there. And the Fed's going to get the wake up call and have to cut rates and cutting rates. That's the pivot. You know, they're going to pivot from rate hikes to rate cuts. And that's good for tech stocks. So buy stocks. Now, that's the narrative. There are two huge fallacies in that uh, in that narrative. The first one is uh, who says the Fed's going to get the message? And if you look at what Jay Powell said and what he repeated, we're going to raise rates. We're going to crush uh, inflation. Uh, you know, I've been following this for 50 years. I've I've never seen a Fed chairman use the word pain three times in one paragraph, but he did, uh, and he meant it. Um, he knows there's going to be a recession. They're causing it in, in part. Um, unemployment's going to go up. He said that. He tied unemployment to um, killing, uh, basically, demand destruction and getting inflation under control. He said, we're, that's how we're going to do it. 
Um, and uh, you're already starting to see some early signs of that. So with that as their focus, who says the Fed's going to you know, get a wake-up call? Almost certainly not. I mean, they told us what they're going to do. They're going to raise rates. And then he said, if we see progress on inflation, we'll pause. But pause doesn't mean cut. It means just wait a long time because at that point, core PCE, that's personal consumption expenditure, core, which excludes oil and food, and that, that's just how they do it. That's their favorite metric. You can debate whether it's the best one, but it, the debate doesn't matter because that is the one they use. Um, that Let's say that comes down to around three and a half. Okay, it's still not two. Now, what Powell, which is their target, so what Powell said is, we don't have to keep raising rates to force it to two. We just have to raise them enough that it'll get to two on its own. That's what they call a restrictive or restrictive policy. So, but that's not a rate cut. That's that he said that might last for a year, all the way into 2024. That's when he was talking about rate cuts. Now, again, this, this can change, but but they've told us what they're going to do. I always say, forecasting the Fed is the easiest thing I do because they actually tell you what you're going to do, what they're going to do. You just have to listen and believe them. Um, now, the hard part is understanding how badly they're going to destroy the economy and when they're going to get the wake up call. That's the hard part of the analysis. But telling what they're telling you what they're going to do is the easy part because they kind of tell you. So, so the stock market notion that somehow they'll be cutting rates is just false. And but the second fallacy is even bigger: is tell me why it's a buy signal for stocks if the Fed is throwing the economy into such a bad recession that unemployment is going to go up significantly and growth is going to come down, inflation is going to come down. Why is that a, a, a buy signal for stocks? Bear market rallies are are really interesting some of the biggest rallies in history have been in the middle of bear markets where you ended up losing everything but for a couple of days or weeks even uh, uh it's hey the bottom's in you buy stocks etc so you have you have to watch out for that so so my expectation is the recession's coming it's going to be really bad um inflation is going to come down fast but not quite fast enough for the fed uh, they're going to keep raising rates destroying demand raising unemployment and we're going to wake up with a, a severe recession, high unemployment, and a much lower stock market. I, uh, yeah, I was around for the 2008 financial crisis. I was around for 1998 financial crisis. You know, I, I, I negotiated that uh, bailout for LTCM. Uh, 98 was interesting because it was a an acute financial crisis that came very close within hours. Actually, you know, I was you know I was in the room with the Treasury and the Italian Finance Ministry and 19 banks and you know a thundering herd of lawyers. Trying to trying to save the world, but uh, we we came within hours of shutting every market in the world. There was a four billion dollar all cash, you know, you could you couldn't use the word due diligence because there wasn't time. It was just, hey, the Fed wants us to do this, so let's just do it. Um, so uh, so that worked, but um, it was it was you know it was a very close call. They would have shut down Tokyo and then around the world, London and finally New York, and you know they would have opened days later. But that's how uh, with trillions of dollars of losses, it would have been worse than what actually happened in, in 2008. It didn't happen, but there was no economic recession at the time. That was, and that's, that confuses a lot of people because, and particularly if you're, if you're using 2008 as a frame of reference, there are, there are financial panics and financial crises and liquidity crises, and there are recessions, some of which are severe. But they're two different things. Uh, 98 was a finan an acute financial crisis with no recession. Um, 2000 was a mild recession, but there was no severe financial crisis. Now, NASDAQ collapsed, but there wasn't a lot of leverage in NASDAQ. There was, there was no contagion there, but it didn't spread because it didn't, no banks, no banks failed, no major brokerages failed, et cetera. Uh, so, so in 1990, a mild recession, but no financial panic. Uh, October 19, 1987, interesting, stock market fell 22% in one day. Not a week or a month, but one day down 22%. And that was a financial crisis, but there was no, there was no recession. Uh, so they're separate things. However, they can happen together. And 2008 was an example. There we had both, but I would encourage analysts to separate those two things again they came together it was it was horrific but um but they can happen separately my my point is we may have um a very bad recession possibly worse than 2008 but 2008 is a model and that may be what we're heading for bearing in mind that these are two separate vectors i'm going to spend 
50 billion dollars to create 51% of the mining capacity in the world, and I'm going to steal all the Bitcoin in the world and take down the Western financial system. First of all, there's no such thing as cryptocurrency. There are a thousand cryptocurrencies. In other words, you cannot speak generically about cryptocurrencies. Jim Rickards hates cryptocurrencies. That's not true. I really, really dislike Bitcoin, and I'll tell you why. But there are cryptocurrencies out there that I think are very interesting and, and worth uh, your consideration. Um, I'm for it. I'm against it. Cryptocurrency is, means nothing. You have to talk about the specific currency. And I'm, uh, and I'm here I'm showing uh, Bitcoin, uh, Litecoin, Monero, and Ether. By the way, isn't it fascinating how the graphical representation of cryptocurrencies is always a gold or silver coin? Um, you know, Bitcoin's gold and Litecoin's silver, Monero's both, and Ether is, is gold. I mean, what are they trying to say? I think that psychologically what they're saying is, well, this is, this is nothing, but if we pretend, if we pretend it's a gold coin, then someone will buy it. Uh, but I, I just find this a little bit of an aside. But no, it's the same thing is true with fiat currencies. You can't be uh, like or dislike fiat currencies generically. Some people do because they just hate central banks. I understand that. But it's a big difference between a, uh, a, a Venezuelan Bolivar and, a, Bolivar and a, a euro, big difference between a Zimbabwe dollar and a U.S. dollar. So in other words, don't talk to me about cryptocurrencies. Tell me what specific one you want to talk about, and that's a more interesting conversation. I think it's really important because this, this field is so muddied, the conversation is so muddied, people not distinguishing between blockchain and currency, not, not distinguishing between different types of currencies, et cetera. I think we need to step back, take a deep breath, and be rigorous in our analysis and think about what we're actually talking about. There's no such thing as a blockchain. There are hundreds of blockchains. In other words, every currency, every token, every um, so-called smart contract, if you're using Ether, has a different blockchain. So there are at least hundreds, perhaps thousands of blockchains, new ones being created every day. So again, don't talk to me about blockchain. Tell me which specific blockchain you're talking about because they're not all the same. And this is critical. The main difference, there are, there are many differences in this blockchain technology, but the main difference is validation. Because remember, the whole idea, the whole idea uh, of cryptocurrencies and blockchain and the original Bitcoin and what Satoshi Nakamoto came up with is that we're, not, we're going to have a trustless system. We're not going to trust banks. We're not going to trust clearinghouses. We're not going to trust exchanges. We're not going to trust central banks. We're not going to trust anybody. We're going to have a decentralized system that a community can validate, and we don't have to rely on anybody in particular. That was the original idea. So the question is, what's your method of validation? And that's what distinguishes one blockchain from the other. So there's, there, I've listed four of them here, but there are others. Proof of work, that's what blockchain uses. And you know what the work is? You gotta like factor these, you know, uh, 87 digit uh, prime numbers uh, into, or numbers into prime factors. Uh, it's a lot of computer crunching, completely clunky, completely inefficient, non-sustainable. I'll talk about that in a second, but that's Bitcoin. There's something else called proof of stake, meaning you actually, this is what Ether is based on, you demonstrate that you have a certain percentage of the processing power, so you step up based on your stake. There's proof of space. Uh, space is storage space on a hard drive, so I get to vote on the blockchain, I get to vote on validating the blockchain because I've decided to devote a certain amount of my hard drive to that process. That's, there's a new coin called Spacement. Uh, and then there's the Byzantine Agreement, or Byzantine Agreement. Um, there's something, there's a version of that called the Federated Byzantine Agreement, uh, which uh, I uh, personally uh, think is the best, um, much, more, uh, uh, much more robust to some of the problems we're talking about, and there are others. But the point is, don't talk about blockchain. Say, okay, what's your, what's your governance model? What's your validation model? Uh, et cetera, and then, and then ask yourself, is that sustainable? Is that robust? Will that resist an attack? Are your, are your cryptocurrencies going to be stolen? These are the questions you have to ask yourself, and there are no generic answers, so I, I cannot emphasize enough. Coin by coin, I hate to use the word coin, uh, you know, whatever, <laughs> token by token, uh, blockchain by blockchain, be rigorous and ask yourself what's sustainable. Now, um, Bitcoin, Ripple, and Ether, and some of these other cryptocurrencies, not all of them, not all of them, but the, but the best known are going to fail. When I say fail, they're going to, you know, Bitcoin might have a, um, 
a $200 value as a uh, token for criminals, and the criminals and terrorists might, might find a, uh, a use case at about $200 per Bitcoin, but they're basically not going to be anywhere ne near where they are today. Why do I say that? I don't want to make a claim without backing it up. The first point is they're non-scalable. Transaction times are slow, uh, and then when you say that to Bitcoin people, they go, aha, the Lightning Network is right around the corner. You know, Lightning's going to, we'll see. You know, they said that about Segregated Witness. They said that about some of these other solutions. They, they don't seem to get community support. They keep forking the Bitcoin, meaning one day you wake up and there's two blockchains instead of one, or whatever happened to that whole idea that we weren't going to have inflation, that we weren't going to pull new cryptos out of thin air. But um, these solutions, you have to understand what the solution is. So what they're saying is, Nobody has a solution for the inherent slowness, clunkiness, non-scalability of the original Bitcoin blockchain. There's no solution for that. So when you hear about solutions, what are they? Well, what they're saying is take a bunch of transactions offline. So everybody in the room could form a group, or let's say every, every coffee shop in Brooklyn, New York, or every coffee shop in Vancouver could form a group. And all the people who want to buy coffee would join that group. And we would agree, so we're in our own little bubble over here, and we would agree that all of our Bitcoin transactions uh, among each other are, don't go on the blockchain. They just get settled in this sort of separate cloud over here, and then we net them out. So, you know, I pay you five Bitcoin, and you pay the person next to you four, and he pays the lady in the back of the room 10, and she pays me seven, and we add all, we net it out, and then periodically, and it could be daily, weekly, monthly, or whatever, we net all this stuff out, and then we take that net and we put that on the blockchain. So that the amount of transactions that have to go on the blockchain is greatly reduced, that's true. But what are, what are we doing? We've created our own network, I gotta trust the coffee shops. How do I know they're not gonna steal my money? In other words, it's only a solution because you're completely negating the original idea. Well, I'll be sure, if you want to, if you want to tear, up the, tear up the original idea and start over, that's fine, but don't tell me you're adhering to the idea of a decentralized trustless network, because you're not. All you've done is create another network. Somebody, uh, you know, I get trolled on Twitter all the time. People tell me I'm an idiot and I don't know technology and all that stuff. And then my more sour moods, I tell them I was coding uh, before they were born. But uh, as, far as, uh, as far as some of these, um, these things are concerned, uh, somebody said, well, you don't understand payment channels. And uh, I actually do. And I said, yeah, I understand payment channels. Uh, we, we had those in the 50s. They were called party lines, we, which is, you know, you pick up the phone and someone's talking. You've got to ask them to get off the phone so you can go. In other words, there was an AT&T network, at least in the United States, but other people could jump in on this little side thing. You know, that's all it is. These are party lines. So uh, that, that doesn't work. Non-sustainable. The energy usage to do, to solve the problem and make the proof of work in Bitcoin is now greater than the annual energy output of Ireland. Imagine taking all the electricity used in Ireland in a year, and that's how much we have to use to, to crunch numbers. By the way, every applied mathematician will tell you that prime factoring is a trivial problem. It it's like an uninteresting, not a, uninteresting problem. But it takes a lot of computing power to do it because the numbers are so big and the possibilities are so great. So we're just wasting the entire electrical usage of Ireland. In a few years, it's going to be the entire electrical usage of Japan. Who thinks, who in this room thinks that governments are going to allow Bitcoin miners to use as much electricity in a year as the entire country of Japan, the third largest economy in the world? That's not going to happen. It's, you know it's not going to happen. Uh, it's not very green. It's not very, it's completely wasteful. In other words, it, it, can't, it can't happen. So that's why I say it's not sustainable. It's going to hit a wall. Non-regulated, you know, I don't have to remind you of all the frauds, new ones popping up every day. Um, and it's not just exchanges. Uh, exchanges are, how do exchanges work? Well, you know, you, I want to go to a Bitcoin exchange. Well, you got to go in, you got to open an account, just like Merrill Lynch or Charles Schwab, right? So, uh, you know, or, or, T, or Toronto Dominion. So you go, you give me your name, your address, your social security number, your bank, wire information, give them all that information, and then send them dollars and they say, okay, you got some Bitcoin, here's your confirmation. Really, how do I know you didn't just take my dollars and send me a phony baloney confirmation? How do I know you're not um, you know, a, a Ponzi, you're using new money to pay off the old money? How do I know you're not Bernie Madoff in, uh, you know, with, a, with a computer engineering degree? Uh, how do I know you're not a bucket shop? How do I know any of those things? The answer is you don't. Uh, so good luck with that. Uh, not to mention Bitcoin whales. They, they estimate there are 1,000 people who control 40% of the Bitcoin. 
Now you got millennials buying, you know, one one hundredth of a Bitcoin for, you know, ten bucks or whatever the math is, hundred bucks. Uh, but you got these, I call them the whales, these thousand people who have 40% of all the Bitcoin. You don't think they have a big vested interest in keeping the price up? And you don't think they wash trade, do wash sales? So A sells to B for 10,000, B sells back for 11,000, A sells back for 12,000, B sells back for 13,000. This is called painting the tape. It's the oldest trick in the book. Um, and there's no profit and loss because we're selling the same Bitcoin back and forth. But what we are doing is creating a ticker that gets the millennials, I shouldn't pick up millennials, three millennial children, but gets uh, people all over the world, maybe a, a garage mechanic in South Korea took out a home equity loan or hocked his inventory, put his entire life savings into Bitcoin and has now been wiped out and is desperate and suicidal. That's what's going on. It's basically rich people stealing from the poor. Uh, not a good business model in my view. And then finally, uh, there's no use case other than criminals, terrorists, or tax evaders. Why is Bitcoin better than Visa unless you're a criminal. Now, if you're a criminal, I get it. If you're buying child pornography, uh, you want to use the dark web and use some cryptos and all that. And if you try doing that with Visa, you'll probably get a call from the FBI. So I understand why it's good for criminals. But if you're not a criminal, if you're not a tax evader, if you're not buying child pornography, if you're not an arms dealer, if you're not a terrorist, then why is Bitcoin better than Visa? Um, there's really no use case for it other than crime. Um, and then it's not elastic. And this is uh, important because there's a finite number of Bitcoins, 21 million Bitcoin. They're getting closer to that level every day. When, and everyone's like, this is a good thing because, you know, the problem with central banks is they print all this money and we're going to have inflation. By the way, we haven't had any inflation for the last eight years. Separate issue. I'll come to that if we don't run out of time. But, um, uh, you know, we hate central banks. They print too much money, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we're going to cap the number of Bitcoin, but, but, but money supply has to be elastic. It can't be too elastic. The problem with central bank money is that it's too elastic, too elastic. The reason, by the way, gold is such a good form of money is that it grows slowly. It grows at about the tempo of world growth. It grows at about the tempo of population growth. Not exactly, but close enough that it's the best form of money anyone's ever discovered. But the problem with Bitcoin, when you hit a hard stop, which they will, and the economy keeps growing, but you want to back it with Bitcoin, so here's your money supply and here's your economy, that's inherently deflationary, right? Because each Bitcoin's got to support more and more growth, meaning your Bitcoin is worth more in theory. But the problem is you never get there. Why? Because if you have a deflationary currency, there's no bond market. The money supply grows based on credit, based on loans, based on various forms of borrowing. The money supply is just a foundation and, the, and the, the, the economy grows with credit. Nobody wants to borrow in a form of money that's going to be more expensive when you pay it back. I'm not talking about interest. That's always part of the equation. But I'm saying the money itself is, um, is worth more when you have to pay back the loan. No one's going to borrow in that loan, therefore no bond market, therefore no viable form of money. So these are all the reasons why this is going to hit the wall.